The board this year wants a big speaker, a big name speaker. We want somebody powerful. We want to get somebody that's going to blow everyone's socks off. I said, you got to bring me LeBron James or Manny Medina. LeBron, I said, LeBron James. The next day, LeBron James left town. And I'm happy to say we got Manny Medina. <laughs> because Manny Medina is dedicated to this city and dedicated to this community. He's not leaving anytime soon. But we're going to welcome George, on the st uh, George Guerra on the stage, and he's going to introduce our speaker. Before I have the pleasure of introducing Manny, um, I would love to welcome Congressman Joe Garcia for a quick word up here. I, uh, I hate when my, my race is described as interesting, but uh, what, I, what I want to tell you is we've got a, we, we, we are up for election, but I want to thank the, for the uh, support we've gotten from the National Realtors. It's made a huge difference to us. And wanted to uh, uh, thank George, who's a phenomenal liaison, as well as uh, Bruno Lopez, who interacts with us. And, and importantly, I also wanted to touch on two issues that I think we need to keep focus on. One, it comes up all the time to get you nervous and get you to go to Washington, which is the mortgage interest deduction. Trust me, that's not going anywhere. I think that's a central tenant, and I think it's something that's good policy long term. The second one, and I think one that some of you felt was uh, the flood insurance this year. Right? This is not a market that's sustainable on its own. And the idea that this year they removed it or tried to sunset it, uh, at least in areas that uh, we all work, caused a collapse. And it's still hurting in the, more, in the business sector, in the commercial real estate, because there is no coverage there. And so you can increase it to any amount. So I think it's key to, to, to making sure we find a, a way to long term solve this as we deal with uh, this policy. Finally, I, you know, uh, one of the things I get to do uh, this month, which is uh, Hispanic Heritage Month, we, we get to talk about it. So M Manny was part of my speech uh, earlier this month talking about people who make a difference in the Hispanic community. You really did get a big fish. So I, I, there's no one that's done more to put Miami on the map and to think forward. And it is about thinking forward. This is a community that isn't about its past, which is great, but it's about the next thing. And uh, Manny Medina has always been on the edge of the next thing. So thank you for what you do. Thank you for the support you give us. And, and thank you for making Miami a better place to live. With that being said, Manny, LeBron was never really an option for me. All right, you were always number one. All right. Um, with that being said, um, be before I introduce Manny, I want to give thanks to Melissa, who was definitely the catalyst in getting Manny over here. When, when they asked me to bring Manny, I said, how do I do this? And Melissa was definitely the, the first angle that I, that I, that I went to. Um, Mr. Medina has more than 30 years of experience as a highly successful businessman with an expertise in technology, finance, international business, and government contracting. Mr. Medina was the founder, chairman of the board, CEO of Terramark Worldwide, Inc., a publicly traded company under the NASDAQ until April 2011, when Terramark was acquired by Verizon. Under his leadership, Terramark has distinguished itself as a leading global pro provider in management, managed IT infrastructure uh, services for Fortune 500 companies and federal government agencies. At Terramark, Mr. Medina brought his vision to deliver a, compre a, a comprehensive set of best of breed IT infrastructure services for purpose built carrier neutral data center facilities to fruition. Mr. Medina began his career in 1974 as a CPA for Price Waterhouse Cooper. He founded Terramark in 1980 and undertook complex infrastructure projects throughout the United States, Europe, Latin America, the Middle East, and Asia. Mr. Medina's vision has transformed Terramark from a commercial real estate company into a global technology leader. His track record of successfully raising funds across entire capital structures during periods of rapid change in the microeconomics environment was vital to Terramark's successful growth. He has raised over a billion dollars for Terramark, expanding its industry's leading service globally and stewarding it through very difficult financial situations in 2000, 2008, and its ultimate sale to, to Verizon for an enterprise value of $2 billion. Mr. Medina has been recognized with accolades from many businesses and community organizations for his leadership and, serve and community service. 
He is a frequent speaker on topics ranging from technology trends, global business, to, uh, to entrepreneur and has served as either a keynote speaker or a panelist at large conferences and IT trade shows. Mr. Medina's leadership in the IT industry and insightful analysis of the market trends have resulted in appearances in CMSNBC, Bloomberg TV, Fox News, and as well as interviews with internationally recognized media outlets on topics such as the adoption of cloud computing, cyber technology, and the dynamics driving key government IT initiatives. Mr. Medina received a bachelor's degree in accounting from Florida Atlantic University. Without any further ado, I would love to welcome our keynote speaker, Mr. Manny Medina. Wow, what an introduction. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, it's a great honor for me to be here today and among so many friends, peers, uh, uh, people that have uh, grown up uh, with uh, my own career and that I admire, having been amongst you uh, many, many times. Um, uh, particularly, Congressman Garcia, thank you for your uh, uh, kind words. Today, I'm going to talk to you about how you're going to make a lot of money. And I know it's a subject that may interest you, right? I mean, you're not, in, you're not you're here because of the great food of the Billmore Hotel, you know, the great sumptuous pasta that we ate. You're here because you want to make money. And if what I'm telling you we're embarking on doing happens, which I think is irreversible, the next time Brian comes up here, he's going to need a larger screen because those arrows are going to keep pointing way, way up there, right? And I think you'll see real estate prices boom. You're going to see the banking business go really busy on fire because we're going to do something that hasn't been done in Miami in a very long time. We're going to bring a whole new industry that is going to do something else besides all this boom. It's going to stabilize. So you are not living in this boom and bust times. Right now, everybody's feeling right, good, right? But many of us that have been around this community knows it's a boom and bust. So with all of us pulling together, all of these things are going to happen. Um, thank you, Melissa, my daughter, who's uh, an integral part of what I'm about to talk to you. She's been a uh, a driving force in, uh, in getting us uh, to the point that we are today. So I'm going to start with a very brief video, and then we're going to jump right into a little history, and then I'm going to tell you, so just stay with me, on how we're going to get to where, I, uh, where, to where I said. We truly are living in a time where almost anything is possible. We're going to be able to meet the needs of every man, woman, and child on this planet. And that's what Emerge is about. So you're going to catch this year in, year out, and get ready for this thing to grow bigger creating a world that is extraordinary. And they represent, for me, the beginning of an epic age of innovation. And hopefully the group that came out this year, one way or another, we could say these were the first emergers. Smart City connects people, processes, technology. Healthcare organizations today need to be able to understand data that they're getting from an individual. And we both have data that has to be brought together to provide world-class healthcare at an affordable price. By 2050, about 70% of the Earth's population is going to be in our urban centers. It's a very different scenario when you can change the future, and that's incredibly powerful. It's not something we do today routinely, but it is coming. We think about business, business needs vibrant ideas, an ample supply of capital, and it needs an ample supply of talent. That there are not enough real internship opportunities out there. So we try to develop platforms and condense data to make it easy to transfer through that bandwidth. The cost to connect are, are virtually zero, and the ability to act is going up exponentially. Fellow mayors, it's an honor to welcome you to Miami and to the first Mayoral Innovation Summit in conjunction with Emerge Americas. We want Miami to become the gateway to innovation, and it all starts here with all of you.
executive from IBM. With Blue Wave Communications. The Bacon Council. Consul General of Jamaica. FPL Fiber Relay. Florida International University. Welcome to Emerge Americas. Join, Join the, the movement. movement. Join the 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 movement. All right. So, um, kind of stay with me now as I take you through a little history and tell you this is actually the conclusion why this is so important and why this is going to make you so much money, right? So, a little history. In 1876, in Philadelphia, we had the first World's Fair. It was as much a celebration of the 100th anniversary of our young nation as it was a showcase for this incredible technology that was just beginning to brew at the turn of the century, except that it wasn't known. The World Fair in Philadelphia was a phenomenal event. It drew 10 million people that came from all over the world, actually, and particularly the United States. So think about that farm boy from Kansas City that spent a week on horseback trying to get to the Philadelphia World's Fair, and that was a big, significant amount of the population. So one of the wonders of the World Fair was this marvelous technology that was not known, particularly the cordless centennial steam engine machine. One of the wonders of this World Fair was that this machine actually controlled and generated everything for the World Fair, and it was handled by one person. That had never happened before in the world, and this was written up all over the world as this wonderful, fantastic event that was going to change our, our lives. So what happened right after the World Fair? What happened after all of this uh, began really becoming kind of mainstream in the U.S.? We had the Industrial Revolution. We had 50 years of the most incredible wealth-building progressive period that our nation or the world had ever known. Obviously, things like the telephone, the airplane, right? Electricity, our love affair with the cars. It was just amazing. It was a time culminating into the 19th, into the roaring 20s, where so many wealth, so much wealth was created, so many new industries were created, that was just an amazing period. It, it was propelled, literally directly connected to that area of excitement that the World Fair uh, created. On the other hand, it also created, uh, there was a negative side to it, and that was, you know, you had child labor, you had a lot of corruption, you had significant amount of workers issues, you had incredible amount of danger in doing this, and there was no environmental protection, of course, as everybody was racing over one another. So you had all this boom, and you had the danger, right, the challenges that it brought, but the, the, the trend was totally uh, uh, irreversible. Something else that when people f think about this area, they think about the, the one families, right, the Rockefellers, the Vanderbilts, you know, the, the one or two or three or ten families. What really happened was that new cities were created. Millions of square feet of office buildings were built, warehouses, roads, an incredible amount of infrastructure was built to support this incredible revolution that was taking place. Innovation was rampant, not just with the big ticket item, everything that, that happened, all the components, and innovation had, had, as, they, as they had never been seen before, ended up creating this incredible amount of wealth. So through a little history now of technology, as I take you through and where we are today, if you think about technology starting in the 60s, right, technologies were like, you know, this is, I love this graph because we're like a little baby, it's just kind of a little curiosity. In the 70s, it really didn't matter that much. It, if you were not academic, uh, you know, you really didn't worry about technology. By the 80s, we were already being empowered, right? You already had your PC, you already had a lot of more power than you had before, and you as a consumer, industry was actually changing, technology was becoming a big, big priority, right? Then growing up as teenagers in the 90s, wow, the internet revolution. All of us, all of a sudden, you know, began really, e-commerce changed the way that we shop and changed the power back to the consumer. It was just amazing how industry had to keep up with technology, right? All of you. You know, if I would have been having, which I did in the, in the mid-90s, if you would ask somebody, you know, who would have email, you would have about only half of the room, maybe a quarter of the room. Obviously, by the 90s, that explosion kept, kept happening. By the 2000s, of course, it was just, you know, everywhere, right? Uh, it was just in seamless communication. All of us actually became totally dependent on, on our PDAs. We couldn't live without it and, and basically became an integral part of our lives. Change industry has changed everything in a way that we could not have fathomed 10 years before that. And of course, right now, 
by 2010 and in this decade, technology is full adulthood. It really literally controls everything regarding our lives. Everything. If you think about technology, it, there's nothing that we don't do from the way we grow our food to the way we fly an airplane to the way we walk on the streets that is not controlled by technology. So why is this so important? Why is this going to eventually end up making your money? Because there's something else that happened in technology, right? It created an incredible amount of data. And this data, we're drinking from a gigantic fire hose that you could not imagine. Just think about this, right? Every minute of every day, 365 days of the year, this is what happens. You have 200 million emails every minute of every day. 2.5 million dollar pieces of content into uploaded into Facebook. I know nobody in this room does it, but 417,000 people swipe into Tinder, right? Nobody here, right? So, anyways, uh, 350,000 WhatsApp shared uh, pictures. It's just on and on and on. So, all of this, whether you're an enterprise or an individual, it's creating this massive amount of data that is changing the way that we live. Consumer, businesses, just you can't do it the way that you used to do it before, and, and this is the result of this incredible advancement in technology. So what happens? It's 1876 all over again. You either adapt or die. This is an area, the biggest opportunities we could possibly think of. This massive amount of compute capacity that now costs pennies is doing every, everything else that I told you about. It's making all of this possible, right? It's changing. Healthcare, you think about the way healthcare is today. Pretty soon, that little mobile device that you have here is going to be as much part of your healthcare plan as anything else that you've done. It's already happening, right? Where you, that's the way that, that you do it. Finance, the banking industry is being revolutionized, right? And so from an opportunity point of view, energy, every centers, we're going to be mining asteroids in no time at all. And this is all because of this massive compute capacity that was unheard of before that makes everything else possible. So from an opportunity point of view, what's going to happen? Innovation is, going to, is flourishing at a pace that had not been seen since the Industrial Revolution. And all of this is going to happen in a very, very compressed period of time. It's not going to be the 50 years that it took from 1876 uh, there. So those are all the great things that happen. On the other hand, we have incredible challenges. The number one challenge I live in this world is cyber threats. We haven't had a cyber threat 9-11 incident, thank God. For me, it's not a matter of if, it's a matter of when, right? And I will tell you something, it is a very, very big danger. Now, people concentrate on the consumer issues with cybersecurity and cyber fraud, and you hear about the target breaches and the Home Depot breaches, and I bet you a lot of you here have at one point or another been either threatened, identity theft. You know, I assure you that your businesses, nine out of 10, you have some malware installed in, the, in your business that you have no idea that is there. Who knows for what reason? Cyber is a major threat that threatens this opportunity. And now, on the other hand, it's a major opportunity within itself. Because what happens is all of this is going to be a continuous perennial show of cops and robbers, right? As we try to you know, get ahead of the robbers and then the cops and so forth and so on. And listen, the problem with cybersecurity today and the cyber issues is that it only takes a young kid with an iPad and a broadband connection to wreak havoc. It is so simple that it's scary. You can go out, there's a black world of malware. When you go out and buy, there's a program called Zeus, which is one of the most potent malwares in the world. You can buy it for $5,000. Then you can install it. You can put it in EWM and get Ron Shawfield's personal bank account and you know, really load yourself up, right? So basically, now there's tech support in the black world for you make sure that you're a satisfied customer. Right, so this is really all happening. The reason why I say this, because for my for purpose of my presentation, they're equally important as far as the opportunity, right? The, all the exciting things and the dangers are not gonna go away anytime soon. So what does this all mean? It means that you have to adapt as an enterprise, as an individual, or you die, right? If, who of you could possibly be in the leasing business, in the commercial business, in the realty business without email? without texting, right, without being connected. You had to adapt, right? So this happens. Now what happens? In order for you to do this, you have to do things different. As a consumer, you have to buy your, uh, your PDA, you have to actually adapt. As an enterprise, 
you have to change. Your information technology infrastructure cannot handle this massive amount of data. It was not designed for that. It's what is called industrial IT. It's mainly information technology, mainly hardware. Just kind of, if you've ever saw one of the data centers, you'll see thousands of pieces of hardware. It was not designed to accommodate this incredible drinking from this data fire hose. So what happens? If you don't adapt, then you're, I'm sure all of you have heard the term big data. This is being able to make sense of that data and utilize it for positive, meaning you're going to be able to compete better. If you are in a farmer, you're not going to be able to predict weather, not if it's going to rain in South Florida. Is it going to rain at the Billmore and help so, and that kind of stuff? So all this adoption, it, it, it means that the way that you process this information is different. You cannot do it the old way. It has to be done the, old, the new way. You've all heard of cloud computing, and you've all heard, this is really agile IT. It means you're able to take in all this massive amount of data and process it for the good in a way that you couldn't do it before. On the other hand, if you don't protect that data in a new way, you're also going to die because you're going to be penetrated. You're going to be reading about yourself in the paper. You know, your bank regulators are going to be all over you. I mean, it's amazing as we deal a few of our portfolio companies that deal in protecting banks, the amount of time and effort that they need to spend on protecting is huge. Unbelievable the amount of expense, right? So all of this transformation is one of the largest opportunities that has ever been. It's a multi-trillion dollar opportunity that is happening as we speak, right? So why is this important to us? And why is it relevant to you, uh, the Realtors Association? Because Miami already had an opportunity in the early 2000s to become the technology hub for Latin America. It almost happened. Basically, it was right the internet revolution. Uh, companies like UP and Patagon and Terra established themselves here. We, as Terramark, built a network access point in the Americas, and it almost happened. But then, of course, there were all the plans. The internet bubble burst. The telecommunications industry imploded. We had September 11th, and all of that went away for almost well over a decade. Right now, we have the perfect storm for this opportunity for us to take advantage of it. Because all of these companies, the major legacy companies, the IBMs, the Cisco's, the HP's, the Dell's, they all need to transform themselves into this new way of being able to process and compute uh, capacity and protect themselves. And they all have a very keen interest in Latin America. Believe me, I tell you, and, and the, the numbers speak for themselves, with what happened with the emergencies here. So you're talking about Latin America being one of the most important sectors for them, right? And the new companies, the Googles and the Facebooks and the Amazons, they have a huge interest in Latin America. So therefore, this multi, almost $400 billion of IT spent, that's just the IT spend itself, right? It has to be done out of somewhere. So think about this area growing, VC and Latin America coming of age. and. So how does that affect us? I think you're getting the trend by now. We already are the capital of the Latin America. You know, look at the port of Miami, right? I mean, the airport, you think about it, right? The multinational ecosystem with all their sales here, the financial capital, all these banks. You know, this is why the, the Fed takes such a great close look at us, right? We are the capital. You don't have to give people down there much of an excuse to come here, except for technology. If you're a young entrepreneur, in Latin America today, you do not dream of coming to Miami. You dream of coming to Silicon Valley. It's a sad but accurate fact. Believe me, I lived through it uh, uh, a lot. And therefore, I think we have a fantastic opportunity to really become the technology capital of Latin America. And we set out to prove it. What we set out is, is how do we actually do this? So we created Emerge Americas, which is this major event that will be happening once a year, kind of like it's the art basel of technology. That's, that was our model. I grew up in Miami. Miami, when, when I grew up in Miami, and as, as a, even, even in the 80s and, and 90s, it wasn't hip to be an artist in Miami. If you were an artist, you had to be in Barcelona, in Paris, in, in New York, but it wasn't hip to be an artist in Miami. Today is hip to be an artist in Miami. Absolutely. You know why? Because of Art Basel. And Art Basel made the difference. And Wynwood, that whole neighborhood, change and everything that is happening in those prices and the restaurants and the activity started with one concept that was Art Basel, brought the people here. So we said, why don't we do the same thing for technology? And we created Emerge Americas where we marry innovation and legacy. The big companies that need to transform themselves with this major innovation movement that is happening in order to support this revolution that is now irreversible. So that's what we started to do, right? 
So Emerge Americas really was the catalyst, not by itself, but we set out to prove it on our own. We had some very good early believers. Some of you here in this room, Ron was a very early believer day on at our 7.30 breakfast. Uh, Alicia Severa, we had uh, Alan Kriebler from, from uh, uh, Cressa. I mean, you, we, we had some of you already very early believers, right? But we said, let's go out and set this up because this is going to be phenomenal for all of us. Now, can it really happen? So we went out to prove if it could happen or not, and we set out. Melissa worked tirelessly, you know, part-time. She's raising four kids. <laughs> but, you know, it was just amazing. The team, we had a group of dedicated people that said, let's go out and prove to the world that this void is here that needs to be filled, right? And what happened? It was an amazing success. It surpassed our most optimistic expectations. We never expected to have 6,000 people attend the first year. And not only, we never expected to have 400 companies participating the first year, coming from all over the world, right? We never expected to have 115 startups. We had to turn down startups. We had about 230 apply to be able to come in this year. Sponsors, they were very generous the first year tough sale because everybody's competing for the same money. So now this year, it's going to be about an ROI. I'm going to invest because I'm going to get something back, right? But we had great uh, sponsorship uh, the first year. We spent a lot of time pulling and cashing in a lot of favors to bring in some very big names. People like Peter Diamandis, who if you've never read his book, Abundance, it's a must read because it's a phenomenal book uh, in, a, in a layman's term. Uh, you know, one of the great, biggest artists in the world Pitbull, Amando Christian Perez, who's become a really good friend. This guy has got 15 million Facebook friends, 15 million Twitter followers. This guy is a phenomenal, and he actually, everything he did, charged zero, but he went in and actually said, I want to, because he's Mr. 305, literally. I mean, he's got it tattooed in his forehand. So and I don't mean figuratively. So basically, it's, so we brought all this great content. The health systems, you know, we brought specialists, talk about technology, cyber fraud, we talked about education, cities, logistics, etc., and it was a great content. And if there's one thing we sure know how to do in Miami, is throw a party, right? Well, I got to tell you something. Some of you attended the parties. We threw some of the best parties <laughs> Miami's ever seen. We had 19 networking events. We had a great networking tool. As you, as you, for the first year, it was pretty phenomenal. It's in the convention center, so we had 51 meet points. So if Brian Bailey was here, and he, I knew he was attending, and I looked him up, I would send him a message. And he, if he wanted to, then say, let's meet up. And then he, I'll meet you at 10.30 in spot number 48. And so networking was a big part of it, right? Connecting and meeting uh, uh, people and having a lot of fun in, in a lot of events. We had, this is really amazing, we had 31 countries represented for the first year, right? We had 28 states, 8% government employees, and we had 35 mayoral delegations. Uh, come and visit for the first year. So, we also, it's very important to get everybody hooked on, so we teamed up and with, uh, with STEM Tech, uh, had 3,000 of our high school students come and, and, and compete as well. This is an amazing, there's a show called South by Southwest, which happens in Austin every year in March. This is what I model uh, Emerge Americas after, a show that I've attended many, many times. And this year, we had substantially more media impressions than South by Southwest. The story was carried all over the world. I had people that I hadn't heard of in years from the Far East and calling me, says, you know, what is going on there, right? So this, it was just an amazing uh, uh, statistic. So we are fully convinced that we are onto something. Here's the void. The void is there. So now what do we do? We need to just put gas on it, frame it, and this is why all of you are so important to be able to help in doing 15, just bigger, better, there's an 18 team member fully dedicated in making 15 a phenomenal experience. Actually, there's a, a, a content team just looking for the best content around the world. Speakers are already lined up. People like Deepak Chopra is already lined up. I mean, there's just a lot of, lot of excitement being built around the 15 event. And obviously, this is viral, right? It's all of you get out of here. And if all of you, you the ones of you who are not, go out and get on your on your sites tonight, instead of swiping into Tinder, you go just go ahead and send a few uh, tweets and tell everybody what was going on. This is really what we need. We want to make 15 solidify what we had in 14. So how do you do this? Again, as I was saying, you evangelize. Leave here. It's really for your own benefit. I'm telling you, we studied every major tech hub around the world, not just Silicon Valley, where the prices are just through the roof, right? Austin, New York, London, Santiago, Chile, Berlin, you name it, 
this will have a direct effect on how much money you're going to earn in a very, very big way because of what is happens, right? So that's it. You can attend. Obviously, we're going to open registration uh, October 22nd uh, as we kick off. You can attend. You can evangelize. You can actually help just kind of sponsors. There's a lot of, I mean, some of you who participated last year. It was funny because uh, in, in, in the case of uh, Ron, EWN, he did it to help, right? And they actually got a bunch of leads. <laughs> they actually made sales, right? So that was, uh, that was pretty cool. So anyways, and you can sponsor, you can talk to your friends, and just kind of help this movement in order for us to really and truly become a tech hub, which is absolutely as clean as you can possibly do in being able to help our, uh, our uh, economy. So um, that's it. Thank you.